this volume's good, everyone can hear me, I'm not too loud, perfect. All right, so today we're gonna to be going over a one-on-one -on -one in time series data analytics with Apache Aero, Pandas, and Parquet. So, uh, my name is Zoe Steinkamp, I'm a developer advocate at a company called Influx Data. We also go by InfluxDB, that's the actual database product. If you wanna ask questions and we run out of time during this time period, you can add me on LinkedIn and ask me there. I'm also in like our Slack community and such. So this talk was originally meant to be about 55 minutes. We're obviously on a bit of a shorter time crunch. So we'll go through the whole agenda. I didn't actually take any of the slides out, but we'll just kind of go as we need to. One thing to note is this is gonna be a lot of a data dumped talk where there's just gonna be a lot of stuff thrown at you. There are QR codes all over the place. There's gonna be code snippets, code samples, Jupyter notebooks. The whole nine yards will be available for you. So, first things first, we're gonna go over why a time series database is important, tools to know, what is Apache Parquet and Apache Arrow. Apache Arrow examples, leveraging Panda for analytics, specifically with time series. This is just gonna be mainly going over joining data. That tends to be what I use it for quite a bit when I'm joining my uh, time series database with my SQL DB and then some examples of autocorrelation, anomaly detection, and forecasting. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think we're gonna to get to go through the examples really, but again, they have a lot of Jupyter notebooks and great documentation, so you can always just read them after. So first things first, who here has worked with time series data? Awesome, about half the room. How many have worked with a time series database with that data? A bit about, not so many, <laughs> which is what I expected. So, what is a time series database? So, really quick, for those of you who don't know, time series data is normally three different types. You got your metrics, those are regularly collected. You can think of something like a Fitbit, great example of metrics. It's constantly tracking you throughout the day, your heart rate, your temperature, your breathing, normal. Events are irregularly created. This can be uh, something like a server. For example, giving out like an alert. That could be an irregular state. And then traces are complete events. Normally in the front end, we think of traces as a call. Like for example, you click on a shopping cart button, it calls many things. It does requests to your back end, maybe it calls up Stripe. All of these calls are a full trace stack, as it's normally called. And it's all time series based, it's just more metadata normally. So when it comes to databases, pretty much everyone here probably has worked with a relational DB and I wouldn't be shocked if that's where quite a lot of time series data for you guys is living. They're normally better at orders and customer records, et cetera. Time series databases don't normally replace SQL DBs, they normally ride alongside them. Similar to how MongoDB doesn't, you know, no SQL document DBs and search DBs also don't tend to replace them, they just tend to all ride together, just for different use cases. Now one thing to note is that time series data is normally pretty good at being in a no SQL based DB because of the fact that it normally has certain problems like a high ingest rate. If you've ever dealt with sensor data, from like IoT or analytics, you'll know it tends to get quite noisy. And it also tends to be data that you want to aggregate on a lot more, do analysis on, for example. And delete, another big one that SQL DBs aren't really known for doing. For a good reason, by the way. So this is a typical architecture and deployment when it comes to time series databases. I know InfluxDB is the one sitting there, but this is for the most part how most of them operate. You could throw Mongo in there instead or other time series based databases in general but you've got your data sources, which is all your timestamp data. You have your data collection. I'll actually go into some methods for that. And then you have your data storage and transformation. That's pretty straightforward, that's just storage. And then your actual data visualization and analysis. And that's normally tooling outside of the DB. So that's gonna be things like Grafana, Power BI, Pandas, for example, in this one, is just gonna be outside libraries. So some tools to know. So one I always like to highlight is Telegraph which is a open source ingestion agent for collecting metrics. Now, Telegraph is taken care of by Influx, but uh, it's actually fully open source and many people use it to store their data in what we call our competitors. So, and quite a lot of our competitors also contribute back to Telegraph as well. So basically, these are a few of the category of Telegraph plugins. There's about 400 of them in total. Some of them I like to call your professional ones. Things like, you know, MQTT for sure is a professional one. CloudWatch, etc. We also have some more fun ones that actually aren't on this list. Uh, things like, oh, I should remember the name of it, but like a shooting game, I think it's called like uh, Command Strike or something like that. We actually have quite a lot of gaming ones. The gaming people love to grab their <laughs> metrics from their games and I think display it in graphonographs and brag to their friends. I think that's really what they're for. 
So something else to note, InfluxDB is a little special in that we, as our new version is at least, it works on SQL, which is a little confusing, but we're not a relational database, we just accept the SQL query language, but we select a specific flavor of it from Apache Data Fusion. So SQL comes in many flavors, as anyone knows, you've got your MySQL, you've got your PostgreSQL, and all of them have slightly different ways of doing SQL writing. Uh, so these are just a few of the aggregate functions that we happen to have out of the box. These are very helpful for a lot of our data scientists who use us. I've used, I use mostly the general aggregate ones in my own work, and occasionally I use the, just the statistical ones. So one thing I'm probably not going to get to talk about too much, but I do like to highlight it, is the Python package for anomaly detection in time series data. It's fully open source. The ADTK is mainly geared towards industrial IoT use cases. We specifically have an example of the autoregression anomaly detection, but I'd just like to highlight this one. One we're not going to be going over is TensorFlow, which is used for machine learning and artificial intelligence platform. Uh, we actually do have some resources for using TensorFlow with InfluxDB. I just don't have them linked in this talk in particular. And then Profit, which is what we tend to use for our forecasting. So this is again used for time series data. You can use it for things like halt winters or triple exponential smoothing. It combines things like seasonality, trends, and holidays. So what is Apache Parquet and Apache Arrow? So Apache Arrow is the in-memory disk format. Parquet is the on-disk format. And Apache Arrow is how you actually call your data out. So Apache Parquet is from the website, exactly, an open source column oriented data file format designed for efficient data storage and retrieval. Basically, this is how we store our data in InfluxDB inside of our disk. So, Parquet allows us to do, you know, it's just really good at storage, especially for large amounts of column or data, which is what time series data is. So, for example, in a, as a comparison goes, Data stored on CSV files, this would be about the size that you're going to get in an Amazon S3 bucket, about how long it would do a query runtime, and the cost to you. Uh, caveat on that, I don't know where this cost is coming from. I actually don't know how old this is, but we'll take it, we'll, we'll take it for now. But the big thing here is that obviously there is a way less storage space, it's about 34 times faster in the query runtime, and there's a lot less data scanned. So it's still valid, even if the cost might be a little strange. So this is just another, uh, another comparison here. So when we were dealing with our old database, which is a time series metrics DB, we also compared it to Parquet when we were originally starting to build out our new version, and this was some of the comparisons that we found. It's just how much, fault, uh, how much smaller it came out when it was in Parquet versus TSM. So Apache Arrow is basically just defining in-memory column or data, that every processing engine can use. So Apache Arrow is used by many companies, not just InfluxDB. I've tried to find a full list, but since it's open source, many people are just flying under the radar and we don't know they use it until I find it in the docs one day. It's language agnostic and it's standard for column or memory. It's efficient for running large analytical workloads, which again is what we like to talk about right now. And it's got a, a wide range of programming languages it supports. So it makes data processing faster and more efficient because it stores data in a way that the computers can read and work with it quickly. In particular, it's using a single instruction multiple data operations, which are more common in like our modern internal CPUs that our actual computers have, which makes sense because a lot of the stuff your internal CPU is running is also kind of like columnar data, time series data, just in general. So finally, Apache Arrow Flight and SQL. So Apache Arrow Flight is basically just the volume transfer. So this is just transferring column or data. It's good for both distributed computing and analytics. And then the SQL is just the SQL flavor of it. So because the Arrow Flight is used by many other companies who have other languages, not SQL, including us, we have another language called InfluxQL, which Flight supports, but Flight SQL obviously does not support. Those people will use Flight instead of Flight SQL. We happen to use both of them just because we're capable of it. So, there's no deserialization or serialization cost. Since it's sent directly, that makes it a lot cheaper to basically send data to other uh, processors. So for example, this used to be a pretty common problem when you wanted to get your data between, for example, Apache Parquet to something like Pandas. Nowadays, you just do something like this instead. And these are a few of the 
companies and just in general uh, open source frameworks, whatever you want to call them, libraries that support this. Some of these are actual companies like Dremio and ClickHouse. Obviously, you can see DuckDB and InfluxDB, and then Data Fusion at the top also supports it, which I'm not really talking about in this one, but Data Fusion is basically like a compute engine that helps us support uh, our SQL querying on the backside. So yeah, basically, that's how we're taking advantage of these three. Uh, with Apache Arrow, it actually powers our client libraries, which is one of the ways people can basically use our client libraries restfully. They can both query the data back out and get it inside of the database using them. And from there, it hooks us up to all of these other outside tools. So to understand some performance difference, again, we're going to read from a CSV file, and we're going to compare a Panda CSV reader, which is the default engine with Pi Arrows, uh, versus, yes, with versus Pi Arrow. And it does it about 15 times faster with arrows in memory column or format, and it comes in smaller as well. I hope that this is, yeah, okay, you guys can read it, cool. I always worry about the fact that comment is very uh, light on this image. Prior to Arrow, also the conversion from uh, Spark data frames to pandas was apparently, I have to admit, I didn't actually know this until somebody told me this recently, it was more of an inefficient process because you would have to serialize and deserialize your data. But now with Arrow, you don't have to do that anymore. So let's go into some examples. So this is how you create an Arrow table, which is pretty straightforward. PyArrow is, again, just the Python flavor of Arrow. As I mentioned before, it has things like Java, C++, and I think Go as well. But basically, the table is pretty simple to create. It's exactly what you would expect. You just get an array, you pop it into the table from the arrays, and then it just names them at the top. Very straightforward. This is if you're doing a flight SQL query and to get your table. So for example, with this one, we're happening to hook it up to InfluxDB, but this works with something like, I think DuckDB also works with the uh, flight SQL client as well. They have a different flavor of it, but same gist overall. But basically from here, you're just asking to select all the data from the IOX machine data where the time is basically the past day. And then you're just asking for the client to consume the read points. And you're throwing this all into a pi arrow table so you can read it. Obviously on the right hand side, yes, above my head, the left hand side, there's a little bit of cutoff on the image, but you get the gist. This would be the relative result of the table. So with this, we just threw it into a pandas data frame, and so we could see all of the, so it could be a little easier to display. So one thing is that Arrow also comes with utility functions, like table to pandas, which will easily convert over to a pandas data frame. You can also load the table in from a parquet file directly. You can also save the table to a parquet file directly. And you can also do aggregation with PyArrow as well. So you can aggregate, for example, you can get the vibration mean, the max, and the min. So all of this is available within the library. And then you can convert it to pint. And finally, one thing that we like to always do is we do downsampling quite a bit with pandas. And so what downsampling is, is downsampling is Basically, in time series data, you're normally getting a ton of data points every single millisecond, nanosecond, or even just a second. But unless you're dealing with something you know, extremely important, most people tend to downsample their data. Going back to your Fitbit again, it's tracking your heart rate every second. I can almost assure you it is. But the actual data that you see when you pull up those graphs, it's not every second. It's aggregated down to what? The hour, you know, the past 30 minutes. That's what downsampling is. It's just pulling down that data into a smaller size, and that's good for storage and cost savings. And especially if you ever notice your uh, Fitbit after like a week or something, the data gets even more downsampled to an extent. It's even less, you know, minute. That's the same thing. They're just downsampling it again. At a larger scale, a lot of our customers like to do this to save a lot of money. And in general, times, uh, people who work with a lot of time series data also tend to do this, just in general. So this is a table result comparison. This is pretty straightforward since basically we just aggregated this down by, I think this is by the 10 minute mark. Yes. So we aggregated this down to the 10 minute mark and then we have our, our CO2, our humidity, and our temperature average, I believe. Uh, yeah, we got the mean for them. Perfect. And then you can also send your downsample data back up to Influx or to another database, whatever you would like. But basically that one's pretty straightforward. You're just using the Pi Arrow client to go ahead and write your data back in. As I said, the client libraries tend to be very restful, and our client libraries are just built on top of Arrow. So this is also an example of how this would look with like a Plotly, and combined in with your Pandas dashboards. Again, the code for this can be found online. 
This is also Plotly and the ADTK dashboard. So this is that dashboard. This is the uh, anomaly detection package I mentioned earlier. So with this one, it's again using the auto regression and it's finding the anomalies within the vibration levels. That's what those little red dots are. And this is an example architecture and the actual code to go along with this. And this is just a very basic machine data aggregated example, but it's very common for us to send this to our customers who are working with IoT data. So I already kind of went over Pyro, but really quick. One thing to note when it comes to also Apache Spark is that you can go ahead and convert Apache Spark with Pyro into Pandas, basically. So I just wanted to show that you could do this. And then there's also still some work to be done. One of my coworkers is working on the Apache Spark program, wanted me to write this up. So I do it for them. But basically they're looking for a direct integration via Flight SQL and a direct PyAero table conversion in the future. So leveraging pandas for analytics. So uh, we tend to find that a lot of people, this is actually the main thing that people come to us and ask to do. Uh, because the SQL query language that we use happens to have a lot of aggregators already built in and stuff, people tend to use pandas less for that when they're working with us and just in general. Uh, so what they do tend to do quite a bit though is they want to combine their data from a, like a time series database and a SQL DB. They've got some kind of ID marker on both and they're basically going to join them up together. So I thought that it would be good to just really quick go over how this looks. Now obviously this is a much simpler data set but that's kind of on purpose. So if you join with no how parameter, so I actually want to show this really quick. So this is what a right how parameter would look like. So when you join from the right, it's pretty straightforward. You're basically, you're keeping all the data, but you're gonna get null values for anything that doesn't exist in both, uh, both data sets. If you leave it alone, it basically defaults to the left. It just pretends that that's what you told it. That one's pretty straightforward. This is the most common, by the way, too, that people tend to do, because they don't tend to wanna drop any of the data. And then if you join with like an outer parameter, you end up with something looking a little bit more like this, where you have like a course is left and a course is right, and then you just have a bunch of null values. If you do an inner join, that's when you're gonna start deleting a lot of stuff. Basically, if they don't start matching those courses left and courses right, and you get those null values, it'll just drop them. It'll just drop the rows. And then when you do a pandas join on the column, this one always kind of confuses me a little bit, but basically now we don't, we, it's, it's very similar to this one, but the difference here is that we no longer get our courses left and our courses right. It combines them into one called courses. So it's just saying that basically these match, I've determined they match, but we're also gonna match them out on the courses and just call it that. No longer a left and a right. And then this one is very similar, except for it's just a straight join where we're actually keeping the, um, I'm trying to remember the name for these, the, the, uh, the things on the very left-hand side, the R1 and the R3, we're keeping those from, I believe it's the original table. Yes, from the table on the left in particular. And another thing that we tend to teach people how to do if they don't already know it, which by the way, I know all of this is available in the docs, but these are some of the more common things that people tend to ask, which is to rename columns. <coughs> so with this one, it's pretty straightforward. We're just renaming test into a larger uh, capital test. So people really know we're testing. It's a strong word there and then resetting on the index. This is especially common if you're dealing with something where the data comes in off like a JSON file format or something and you need to actually get an index on it. So you would just reset the index and now it will basically add one for you. So let me check the time. All right, so we can go into some of these examples here. So what is autocorrelation? So basically autocorrelation refers to a degree of similarity between some given time series and a lagged version of itself over successive time intervals. In other words, it's intended to measure the relationship between a present value and any past values that you may have had access to. As you can see, a positive autocorrelation looks like a nice little graph versus a negative correlation just looks like a bunch of random dots everywhere. So when we did this example, we decided to go ahead and use some data from uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Center that is such a long name, but everyone just calls it NOAA. Basically, it just, it's tracking a lot of the waterways and, um, and streams and rivers and oceans within the US. And we're using that to look at a river specifically in Santa Monica, California. So basically what we're doing here is we've put this data into InfluxDB just to make it easy for us to access. 
and then we go ahead and query it back out. And we're selecting, specifically I've highlighted this, we're selecting the mean degrees as HGO temp from this database, and we want to group by the time of the past 12 hours, and we want to limit it to 60 so we don't end up with like, you know, 100, 600 instead. And with that, we're also going ahead and we're popping it into a pandas data frame so we can actually look at this on a graph. So from looking at our plot, it's not obviously apparent whether or not this data will have really any autocorrelation. For example, I don't detect any presence of seasonality, which would yield normally a high autocorrelation, which really just means that we're not seeing like rolling hills. That's normally what seasonality tends to present when it's graphed. So then we can calculate the autocorrelation. So pandas actually comes with an autocore function here. It computes specifically the Pearson correlation between the series and its shift itself, which basically just means it's saying that there is any autocorrelation in these. When the value returns back close to zero, it basically means there's not. If it's much closer to one, that normally means that there is a value. And if it's negative one, there's a negative correlation. So obviously ours is returning back 0 0.07, which isn't that great. So that would be not very much correlation going on here. However, with an autocorrelation plot, we can see that they are within a 95% confidence interval represented by that solid gray line, uh, which verifies that our data also doesn't have any autocorrelation as we expected. So basically, yes, this data was not autocorrelated, which basically just means that the Santa Monica River doesn't really change its temperature based off yesterday's temperature. There's no autocorrelation that yesterday's temperature is going to reflect today's which kind of makes sense in this river because it's getting fed probably by something like snowmelt or just another thing that's basically making it so there's no correlation between yesterday. This is a little bit different obviously in, a, in like an ocean or something where it's probably a little more stagnant, but in a river it's very flowy. <laughs> obviously they, they flow down, so it's a little different. And seasonality. So these ACFs can also be used to uncover and verify seasonality in time series data. So let's take a look at the water levels from the same data set. So this is going to be pretty similar, but we're basically now selecting water levels from our database. And we're specifically selecting a slightly bigger time set. So we're selecting a few days in particular. This is also a historical data set. It's not like real time monitoring or anything. So that's why we're asking for all the way from 2015. In fact, I think it's only reported like once a month or something. It's a government, it's government data, you know, they're not that fast. So just by plotting the data, it's fairly obvious that seasonality probably exists. It's evident by this predictable pattern in the data. As I said earlier, rolling hills tend to indicate a bit of seasonality. It's pretty common in that. But from the ACF plot above, we can see that our seasonality period actually consists of roughly 246 timestamps, which is basically just saying uh, between the two time values, there's about 246 values between them, time steps. I actually had to learn that word. I didn't know it off the top of my head at first when I uh, was originally reading through this code. So while it was easily apparent from plotting the time series in figure three that the water level data had seasonality, this isn't always the case. So one thing that I'm also gonna link to is called seasonal ARIMA with Python. He shows how he must add a seasonal component to his ARIMA method in order to account for seasonality in, its, in his data set. It's a great example of just how using ACLF can help uncover hidden trends in the data. And with that, these are some of the resources for the autocorrelation that I've been talking about. So we have a blog that actually goes over all of this data set. The Jupyter Notebook, which is where you'll find the actual information. The seasonal ARIMA with Python, that's the, the blog from the author I just mentioned and then how to not use time series for forecasting pitfalls, which I just now realized is probably not in the right spot for resources because we we're just about to get to forecasting. But that's okay, it can live there for now. So anomaly detection and forecasting. So these are some examples of anomaly detection that we tend to deal with. Things like autoregression, level shift AD, seasonal AD, seasonal anomaly detection. And when we're dealing with multiple time series sets, we get into things like median absolute and deviation, and then some examples of forecasting. So one thing to note is all the forecasting examples are gonna be off that QR code, and I'm not gonna be going over them in this talk in particular. They're a little more complicated and they would take way too much time, to be honest. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be using the autoregression AD algorithm. So it basically detects anomalous changes of autoregressive behavior in time series, it captures the relationship between a data points and points within the near past and can be used for cyclic but not seasonal series in some situations. 
there are different uh, there are different anomaly detection algorithms for if you're going to be dealing with seasonal sets. So after we have acquired our data into a pandas format, this one's pretty straightforward. We just created a sample data CSV. We can't always make it difficult and send data into a database. Sometimes we just got to be easy on ourselves. But this one has a timestamp and a value and a label of zero. So we prepare our data for consumption. So basically with this, we're just replacing that, uh, that zero, we're dropping the label because it was zero and irrelevant for this basically. And we've got our timestamp and then we're actually setting the index to the timestamp as well. So this is where some of those things I talked about earlier come into play. So visualization before we put this algorithm on it. So this is what it looks like. We see some, some spikes. I mean, no offense to this graph, but I've seen more exciting, um, but it gets the point across. And then we apply the autoregression AD. So this is just like an imported package, as I mentioned before, fully open source, easy for anybody to use if they would like. And with this, we're just describing basically how we want this to be plotted on. That's why we, for example, set the anomaly color detection to be red. And then this is what it actually looks like when we apply that anomaly detection algorithm. So as you can see, we got some anomalies. We got some red dots throughout uh, this time period, which it looks like this is a few days basically. And actually I think this is a few months. It's a month, yeah, it's like a month and a half. So over the month and a half, we have about probably 20 or 30 uh, anomaly detected values. And some of them are quite clustered too. So these are some more of those resources, which is also definitely how that forecasting pitfall one snuck in last time. So this is also, uh, the Pi Arrow docs is added to this as well, and the forecasting and anomaly detection examples. And then all the other ones are added because a long time ago somebody asked me to basically put them all on one slide. So I do feel bad now that I have both, but that's okay. Extra QR codes for all. This is for a try it yourself. So obviously on the left hand side is the Influx data website, who would have thought. Uh, the right hand side though is our community, that's where I hang out in as a developer advocate, that's where we put all of our projects and stuff, that's where we have things like our data science examples, uh, examples using IoT devices, MQTT, much more exciting stuff. It happens to use Influx, but it's a little less, you know, sales pitchy. It's all open source too, because it's on GitHub. So if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to ask them. Why did you choose the auto correlation functions instead of the Fourier transform function? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Why did you choose the auto correlation instead of the Fourier transform? It was just a, it was, uh, we're just asking about, oh sorry. We're just asking about why I chose the auto correlation. Yes. Honestly, it was just probably, it was just a simple one to use. Honestly, that's it. I think actually in the examples, we have a few of them actually. But that was the one I chose to display. Uh, if anyone does have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the Discord chat. Um, that's the talk, or we'll um, keep Zoe up with So, Joe, thank you very much.